Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. I've really been thinking a lot about my history and how I entered into writing about spiritual life and how I've conducted myself, what I've emphasized. And I was studying with a teacher and I really didn't have much contact with the typical things that people read about spiritual life when they're investigating by reading books and reading personal accounts online and things like that. I didn't do that till I was really pretty old, like in my mid thirties. So when I started reading those things, you know, like autobiography of a yogi and things like that, I realized that a lot of those accounts kind of hopped from one extraordinary spiritual experience to another. And no one was really talking about what happened in between. So when I started writing, I really wanted to show in some way, what is it like the granular day of practitioners and what does it really feel like for just ordinary loves like us to enter into a serious spiritual practice when we're not maybe going to be flying through universes and all the things that people did in those stories. And then when I started teaching more formally, my emphasis has always been on making teaching simpler, more easy to understand, bringing them into a language that can be understood by contemporary people, people from this culture by and large. And I have really de-emphasized a lot of the intellectual study that I did when I was in graduate school, because I spent about 10 years reading texts from this tradition, both scripture and commentaries and other kinds of things, histories. And in doing that, I encountered a lot of difficulties trying to sort of piece together reliable teachings through those books and reliable accounts of the tradition I was interested in. And I realized that hardly anyone was going to do that. So I could bring what I had learned to people, but it it would have to be in a less intellectual way. It'd have to be in a more digestible form. So that's what I've been focusing on. I've been thinking a lot recently about bringing more of the experience of magic and of the absolute into the teachings that I do on a more regular basis and really finding that the space that I want to inhabit is the one where, yes, we talk about our everyday lives, and we talk about our relative experience, but that the magic, what I call the round world, is also more present in those teachings. I've been doing that for a little while now. And the reason I bring this up is because I want to start to give a possible answer to the question of what should we do when we want to do more by saying that from my own perspective and the perspective of all the traditions that I have encountered and have been important to me, The purpose of a human life, what is built into us as our purpose from the beginning, is to discover the nature of the self, the nature of reality. That's what we're actually here for, and to have some fun along the way doing that. So despite the fact that some of us feel we are in this extraordinary time of crisis, and I already mentioned a few times in previous satsangs that for millions of people around the globe, existential crisis is a daily experience It's easy to say, okay, we have to put aside everything or this is more important than other things or have our emotions and focus be hijacked by this kind of event, especially if we've been sheltered from existential threats for most of the time. We're busy dealing with this. But the fact remains that the actual purpose of becoming manifest is to discover your real nature, discover the nature of reality. So the number one thing that you can do is that, and that is always the number one thing you can do. And it is not selfish because the more you discover that and discovering it is tantamount to embodying it. You can't discover it in an intellectual way. 
You can only discover it in an experiential way. And experiencing that means that you embody more of it, which means that you embody more fully wisdom virtues such as compassion. It means that you're more skillful in your giving in a relative sense. It means that you're more loving. It means that you're more intelligent. It means that you're more sensitive. It means you're more creative. All those things happen as you begin to wake up. You become more focused on the whole and less focused on little individual you. And eventually you just lose any sense of being a discrete individual. You don't lose the sense of your personality as something that's occurring in this larger mandala. It's not like you lose the sense of having some kind of individual-esque experience. It just isn't something that you now think is an absolute, right? It's not the baseline. It's just an experience that is happening. So in that respect, your field of concern becomes much, much larger. And when you're choosing to do something or not do something, the factors that go into those choices are many, many more, myriad more factors. And as the more that you wake up, the more waking up just means coming into contact more with living presence and all of the wisdom virtues that are inherent in that. Um, As you wake up more, you are more and more in a state of wanting to always do the best that you can, wanting to always do the best for others, taking the needs of others more into account. So for this reason, there's nothing more important for you to be doing. If you're just doing that, if you're continuing to do your practice and you're trying to bring this experience into your practice, onto the path, and you're doing your best to relax and examine your own reactivity and relax your reactivity around this, if you're doing your best to remember view, especially about death, (laughs) and to bring your whatever degree of view that you do embody into your ways of relating to other people, if you're doing your best to have your view be widest, that when you choose things to do, you're taking the most people into consideration or you're expressing kindness and care in the largest way that you can, you're already doing your best. You're already doing everything you need to be doing. And everything would already be included in that. So if you are being in the state of your practice, if you are not compartmentalizing, if you are bringing everything onto the path, then it doesn't really matter in a relative sense what you do. Anything you choose is going to be helpful. Whether you choose to stay home and do puja and pray for people's well-being or whether you choose to volunteer at a food bank or whether you choose to donate money every day or whether you choose to do the best possible job you can homeschooling your kid or whether you choose to drop off lattes and pastries at your local hospital, which I read this morning that my favorite, favorite, favorite cafe in the whole world just did that this morning in Portland, Oregon, which I thought was just so sweet. They got the, they had the people from the cafe get all dressed up in these like homemade hazmat suits. <laughs> they have these little cardboard, this was upper left roasters, these little cardboard house, they look little houses with handles and they put lattes and food inside and they like went up to the hospital and dropped them off. I mean, that was just so sweet. So it doesn't really matter so much what we do. It matters in what condition we're in while we're doing it. Everybody knows everybody who's ever been in contact with any spiritual community of any stripe. (laughs) Everybody knows that there's always that person who is somehow in a very upfront public position, but whose every attempt to mime the gestures of service and kindness falls flat because they're in such a state of suffering and anger and their emotions are so distorted. So there's always that person right around, you know, they're making all the right gestures. Things are being served. They're doing something, you know, but there's always that edge (laughs) or deliberate uh, going on. So that's just an example of how it really doesn't matter what you're doing. It matters what condition you're in while you're doing it. And Swami Lakshmanji said this really beautifully. He's a 20th century teacher of Kashmir Shaivism. What he said is sort of the umbrella view that we have at Jayakula for doing service. I don't know the exact words, but 
He said something like, doing seva does not mean doing service for your teacher or community. It doesn't mean cooking food for your master. It means being in a state of God consciousness. So you can be cooking food for your master and just be a completely, some completely non-service oriented condition. And and then it becomes non-service. It's not service if you're doing it that way. It's just ordinary stuff, reactivity and stuff. I was asked to write a piece about devotion for a new magazine that just started up called Tarka. It's a magazine of articles about stuff related to quote unquote Eastern spiritual traditions and the first issues on devotion. One of the questions that we were supposed to respond to is sort of what devotional acts do you participate in? Something like that. And I said, well, there really are no devotional acts. They're only devotional people. For instance, in Zen traditions, there's a lot of cleaning that goes on. If you're in a state of devotion while you're cleaning, then it's a devotional act. But if you're pissed off and resentful, then it's not a devotional act. You could be doing the exact same thing as the fellow with the broom next to you. Depending on what condition you're in, it is or it is not a devotional act. The devotion is your condition, not not what you're doing. And I would say the same. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It matters what condition you're in when you're doing it. And if you're really in a relaxed devotional state, your smallest gesture is going to have a much bigger ripple effect than if you made a much bigger gesture in a state of pride, which happens often. So think about that. Even the worry that we're not doing enough is somewhat prideful, possibly. Because here in our culture, we always think we have to do something big, just like it's like an accomplishment. (laughs) We don't. You've probably heard of the butterfly effect, right? When a small action in some sort of energetic system has a much bigger effect than you would think. This is real. When you're looking with inner eyes at the aliveness of everything, I do this lying in my room at night sometimes just for entertainment purposes. (laughs) I'll just sit and look at all the dazzlingness. But one thing I've noticed is that if I have my hand up like this and I just move one little finger like this, I can see across the room that that dazzly stuff has also moved, like just from doing this. I've often wondered, like, how is that? But (laughs) it's like quantum entanglement, right? Not literally. I'm just saying using that as kind of a (laughs) semi-sarcastic because actually I'm not really into all that correspondence between science and this. But it is true that everything we do has an effect far away from us. And if we're just sitting, being extremely awake, doing absolutely nothing but that, the effects are going out. I've always noticed stuff like this. You know, I've had a few teachers who were pretty far along in their own development, spiritually speaking. And when you would uh, be sitting waiting for the teaching, as they were coming into the room, you could feel these waves of energy, these little gentle waves coming at you. Very sweet. Before they'd even gotten into the hall where the teaching was happening. 